Hey, hey, everybody. It is Kelly Nielsen here, the Grief Guru. And on this channel, we discuss all things related to grief. What does it look like? What does it feel like? But most importantly, we share tips, tools, and resources for how to move through grief and get back to living a life that you love. I'm so excited for this episode specifically because we are going to be chatting with Holly Menard, who is a death doula. And if you've never heard of that before, you're not alone. I had no idea that this amazing service even existed, that people were doing this work, but that's absolutely what she does. And she's here to share with us more about what it is, what a death doula does and their services and how she got into it. So Holly, thank you so much for being here with us today. Why don't well, we start by you. just sharing with the folks, you know, how it is that you got into this work, why, you know, how you stumbled upon it and why it's so personal for you, why you decided to have this be your vocation. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mouthful. <laughs> well, I feel like that I've had a number of experiences that were really notable in my life that had to do with experiencing death. And it starts with me being in a healthcare profession as a nurse. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like I was always gravitating towards caring for people that in some way were facing a life-threatening illness and were going to be facing also the end of their life. Mm -hmm didn't realize it at the time. Mm. Now looking back, I, I do. So when I first came from New England to work at Duke, I was a chemo nurse on a research unit. And what happened there is that it was a research unit and most people did not live mm. through their therapy. They, they did have some remarkable remissions that lasted for a period of time. And we all celebrated that and we became family. Mm. So that was really a, a gift to me that in the midst of it all, that we had that connection together, which is carried through to today. And I mean, my desire to create mm. a relationship that way with the people I work with. Yeah. So, and then what ended up is that different members of my family were diagnosed with various types of cancer. And mm. one of them was, it was a memory, possibly Alzheimer's that was going on for them. And so I was living with a lot of that uncertainty and the unknown and what was it gonna be like for you know, this person that I love to go through the experience that was ahead of them. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that as I look back, it really was a lot of discomfort about the fact that we didn't really talk about it. We didn't really talk about what was going to be happening and how could we be there? How could we be supportive and, and lay aside the relationships possibly that we had had previous that that could really benefit from some healing and and having it be that we could be present. So I look back on those experiences and I and I knew that at the time I would have loved for it to have been different. Mm. And it was what it was. Mm. So as I become more knowledgeable and and um, became a massage therapist and specialized in oncology massage as soon as I found out it was possible to do that. Mm. And um, that brought me into another relationship with people, some of which were reaching the end of their life. And I'll always remember them. I mean, I remember people from 40 years ago that on the research unit, I remember their names even. Mm. And it, that's pretty remarkable to me because the other work that I've done, I can't say the same thing. Mm. And then more recently, six years ago, my husband, excuse me, my son died unexpectedly. And that really threw me into a, anything can happen at any time, mm. kind of a um, mode of, um, wow, how do you, how do I deal with this? How do I make some meaning out of it? 
And it was, you know, I, I hugged him at six o'clock that night. And then by 1130, the same night, I was getting a call from um, my husband, who I just become separated from, to meet me in the emergency room because our son had had an accident. Mm. So, and then we had 24 hours with him where he actually wasn't conscious to be able to communicate with us. Mm. And yet I've learned that the last sense to go is hearing. Mm. And so we, had that time to communicate with him and probably even equally as important, if not more so, our own words that we really wanted to be able to say, to have that opportunity to say goodbye. And it was just so sudden. He was running across the road, age 33, and he gets hit by a car. Wow. You know, it was night and raining and and, and so the next thing I know, like I said, 24 hours later, his friends are going in and saying goodbye to him. And, and we're sitting with him at his bedside and making decisions. Yeah, it was, it was unfathomable. It really was. And I was in such total shock. Mm. But, it, you know, again, it's, it's, it's finding meaning in the midst of these difficult experiences when we're in the midst of them and they're anticipated or when they're unanticipated, mm -hmm. which you know has its own challenges and opportunities that go along with it. So then fast forwarding a few years, I experienced the death of my beloved dog and I wasn't expecting that either. It was over a month's time really that I, had to prepare. I didn't, I didn't want to prepare. I didn't want to think about the fact that my 12 and a half year old dog wasn't going to live much longer. Mm. And, and it happened that way. And, and I was there for him the best way I knew how. Mm -hmm. And then a few months later, I found out that there's such a thing as end of life doulas. And it was actually on social media. Mm. And I went right to the site and learned everything that I could and talked to the people at the school. And next thing I know, within a matter of, of a month or so, I was enrolled in the program. So that's how I, I came around to, yeah, I'm really so... feeling like it, 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 it's, it was my calling. I knew as soon as I saw it, I went, this is what's next for me. Hmm. That's so amazing. There's, I mean, there's so much in there. Um, that's what we were, when we work with clients, we're helping them do exactly what you've done. You know, the, the last step of the process we do is finding a purpose for your pain. Right. And even though things are unexpected and hard and unfair and all of that to figure out how you're going to use it and apply it going forward in a way that's meaningful and in a way that's honoring what you've been through and who you've lost and all your experiences and, what a great way. And, and how exciting that is when you find that, right? When you find that thing where you're like, oh, this is it. Like, this is the thing that I'm supposed to do. This is the, maybe not necessarily just the reason that these things happen, but the way that you can make sense of it and you can make some good out of it going forward. It's so powerful and so healing and, and so necessary. You know, I think as you're talking to, it just boggles my mind that we have teachers and coaches for literally every area of life, you know, we have so many teachers and coaches about bringing life into the world and Lama's coaches and labor coaches and all these things. But when it comes to passing and ending, like we, we, we have counselors and we have books, but we don't have a lot of what I would call the practical, like in there in the trenches with you, you know, the do's and don'ts and the things that are helpful. And it, it just boggles my mind that like the hardest thing we face as people, we don't have people really showing us how to do it well or to walk through it with us. And so just explain for me and for the people that are watching, like what really is the role of a death doula? Like how would you describe your services to someone that you're potentially going to work with? Well, we are, we are non-medical. 
-hmm. and we're professionally trained and we we serve the dying person and mm -hmm. their family their primary caregiver and you know the whole idea is to educate to um, assist people in finding that inner strength that we all have but when it comes time to getting a life-threatening illness it's it's like all that can go out the window and the, the, the healthcare system simply isn't set up or are the people, I'll say namely the physicians trained to be able to have these difficult conversations mm -hmm. that involve delivering the news, you know, hey, hey, we can't do anything more now. Right. We've gone as far as we can. So there, here's that person, they may have gotten five minutes, maybe more of that physician's time and then they're gone. Right. And then they're, you know, maybe all by themselves or, or with a family member trying to make sense out of what's up for them for the next of whatever period of time it is that they have left. So, so doulas come in either from time of diagnosis or it could be months or weeks or just a matter of the last few days of a person's life. And, and our purpose is to provide, it's a holistic kind of a service really, because mm. we're looking at that whole person. We're not caught up in the healthcare scene, right? but we're not in the doing this so much. We're, we're about, we're really about being present about focusing our attention on this person and what do they want and what do they need and what are their desires? Mm -hmm. like if they could have it happen any way, given, given that it is devastating, given that they're gonna be leaving their loved ones and all that that involves mm -hmm. and, and the process, which is inevitably gonna in, unfold the loss of their independence, um, becoming more and more dependent for some of the you know the things that we just take so much for granted and um so we're we're there i i see myself there as someone who um yeah if, if there is a place inside of you where you have experienced and and you were stronger than you thought you could ever be and and we have, I have time. I say mm -hmm. we, <laughs> we, we, I have time to sit and listen to people share mm -hmm. about that, about how is their life unfolded? You know, how are their relationships? How do they feel about this diagnosis that they've been given that has an end point to it? And um, it's not a rushed conversation and it's not about, expecting anything particular to happen mm -hmm. other than, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's a safe place. It's a safe people. It's a safe place for that person to kind of fall into. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't have to be somewhere other than where I'm at. I don't have to do anything other than just be here knowing this person is listening to me and I'm being heard. And, and that's huge. Yeah. And so there's that, there's that emotional support factor mm -hmm. and then, and spiritual as well, because people are looking at that and it's all part of the making meaning, which is really huge for both that dying person and their family members, their friend and their community, everybody that, you know, is a part of their life. Yeah, I'm thinking I have two thoughts running simultaneously. One is, it seems like your focus is, is fairly focused on the person who's passing away, but I've heard you mention family and caregiver as well. So do you really see yourself serving the person who's passing away or is it equally you're serving them and their family? How do you view it? Well, the way I view it is that it's, it's my person who, and I don't even, um, we refer to the person that we're caring for as, well, they're first a person mm. and very much alive. And then they're our client. Mm. So our client comes first. 
Okay. We, we serve the client. And then there are cases where the caregiver is really the one that's making the decisions because their loved one isn't able to make that decision for themselves. They're beyond that point. Mm-hmm. So, so I would say that it's equal and at the same time, it's my client that I'm first and foremost concerned for. And then that sort of answers the second question. You're obviously talking about just unpacking and processing whatever is going on within them, you know, emotionally, intellectually, all that kind of stuff. But then what about the more kind of practical logistic side of funeral and life insurance, all the things that come along with passing? Are you are you helping and advising or helping with some of those pieces as well? Definitely. Definitely, that is. So I refer to myself as heart-centered and as well as practically mm-hmm. centered, you know? So we, we step in and we can provide a number of different services depending on what that person needs and wants. So it can be the end-of-life paperwork. Right. Not everybody has that done they, or they haven't looked at their will for years. And so it really needs to be updated Mm -hmm. and the whole idea of advanced directives and how important it is to identify who that person is that's going to be making the decisions and even before that it's it's asking some really tough questions like do I want to have any heroic measures when that time comes is it possible that there's something that's going on for me that could be reversed and that would give me more time? And it's very personal. That decision is very personal. And family members may not understand. So that's a whole nother conversation too. It's like, can my wishes and my wants be honored? And and that's where that, inner strength comes and that that ability to tap into the resilience to be able to say no I don't want this and please honor my decision yeah I always I mean it's such a necessary I mean all these conversations are necessary they're so vital and necessary and they don't happen all the time you know so it's amazing to be able to help facilitate those conversations I Mm -hmm. always lean towards the family that's losing the person right because even from a funeral standpoint I just think about when someone passes away and if you haven't had these conversations and if you haven't Um, known that it was coming, if it was sudden or surprise, and even the idea, do they want to be cremated or not, you know, is such a big thing. And thankfully, we had had those conversations, even with my son, just weirdly one off, and we all, I knew what, what his wishes were. But even for the family side, I see a lot of people have big extravagant funerals or do all of these things because they somehow feel like it makes them a better, you know, that they're grieving more, that their grieving is more justified by doing X, Y, Z when it comes to the funeral and the service and how wonderful to be able to just discuss those things up front. And, and especially for the person who's passing to say, no, I don't, I don't want all that stuff or don't feel the need to do it or I do or, you know, but to just have that be clear because I see so many grieving people really wrestle with what to do and what not to do and what their person would have wanted and, and whether they're honoring them well and all of these things that can really cause a lot of inner turmoil and can really um, get people stuck and not healing and recovering because they're wrapped up in those things. And so just what a gift to be able to get all those things out of the table as hard as it might be as much as nobody really wants to be having that conversation, but it's such mm-hmm. a gift to be able to have it, you know? And it can be very specific too. It can yeah. be like, this is, this is how this is how I want to spend my days. You know, I want to, I want to go on, I want to go to some tropical island while I can and go with the people that really matter to me, whoever that might be, and just really live it up. Yeah. And, you know, and then it could be, 
I want to go out shopping or, you know, I want to, I want you to help me get my garden planted or Mm -hmm. there's a book I started or, you know, any number of creative things. So um, getting back to the paperwork, there's also a living will, which Mm -hmm. gets even more personal and specific about what a person wants. And then there's something called five wishes. And that gets really very, very much like, this is how my um, end of life is unique. And where, you know, our, our thumbprint is unique in all the world, right? So what's important to us is, is not like the same as it would be for another person. Mm. And how wonderful to be able to say, this is how I want it. Yeah. And to know that there's somebody that's there that is like, yeah, you get to have that. And, yeah. and as much as possible, we're going to see that that happens for you. I can just see such a value of having a neutral party, right? Because the person who's dealing with the the diagnosis and the illness and whatever, they have their own emotional struggle that they're going through. The family members have a different, and, and my bet is neither side wants to hurt the other, right? They, but they also want what they want and want to be able to communicate their wishes and their needs and all that kind of stuff. So how great to have a neutral space that can really hear. And, you know, like you said, for the person to just have a safe place to unload and process wherever they're at without fear of hurting your feelings, right? Because you're just there as Switzerland, just there to to (laughs) hold space and to be there. And that's, that's pretty powerful. That's amazing. I, how do people find you? Like if somebody's in this situation, do you work with people all over the country? Is it all online? Is it in person? Is it a combination? Like talk to me a little bit about that. It can be anywhere, really. We found that out during the pandemic mm-hmm. that that virtually we are able to and do this even before I finished my training, actually right before the pandemic and people do this were already working with their clients so they were serving them virtually, mm-hmm. creating with them. Like another part of what I do is, is legacy projects, mm. which is how do you want to be remembered? What's important to you that you can leave behind and know that every, every aspect of every thought that you consider ahead of time is is going to be priceless yeah for your loved ones that will be here and and so that's a whole nother area to to um spend some time on really yeah. and it can be a while so I know you asked me about where we can serve then I got into the virtually part. We can we can deal with a lot of those things virtually, mm. as as well as the actually going up and knocking at somebody's door, whether it's their home or whether it's a facility, and be like right there. And it's like a, you know, reaching out my hand, you know, putting my hand on theirs, and that touches, that touches really priceless Mm -hmm. for a lot of people and family members are not necessarily comfortable with that in fact Mm -hmm. I had one woman who said I know I'm not comfortable with it and and I don't think my other siblings are either so Mm -hmm. the fact that this is something that you offer to her that was huge Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. that aspect of of my support Mm -hmm. and um so how to find me it's, it's really interesting because, um, of course, there's the family and there's friends and there's word of mouth mm-hmm. and there's a professional directory. And I'm a member of it, the organization is called the National End of Life Doula Alliance. So as a member, I have a listing there and it's really um, it's, it's exciting and, and it's um, a relief really that people are finding out that we exist mm-hmm. and so I would not want to neglect the part about what the media there's a lot happening in the media really that is is helping get the word out 
So there are interviews and you know um, audio, um, the, the video, the audio, the uh, various going to the website like CNN has blogs on their website. New York Times has done an article on doulas and the whole death positivity movement. Mm. And, um, and then NPR has a program called Embodied. So I had a client, actually a couple to call after they had listened to an Embodied program. Mm. And this woman had just recently gone through testing and, and thought that this abdominal pain was not in her wildest dreams going to end up being diagnosed as stage four pancreatic cancer. Hmm. So once they got past that numb stage, it was like, okay, how, how are we going to go about this? Hmm. Sounds like to have an end of life doula would be a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And they, they plunged head first into actually interviewing doulas. And then, um, and then I got chosen along with one other person. They actually mm. wanted two doulas, which I think is a great idea because we can mm. cover each other mm. you know, as far as time-wise goes. And um, um, so what was I going to say? Oh, <laughs> well, what, what ended up happening? Yeah, I, briefly. What ended up happening is that she became less and less interested because it was like the disease process that was going on took over and she was yeah. so tired and didn't have the energy and wanted to, instead of what we had talked about being totally an alternative way called the green burial. Yeah. And that's a whole nother topic for conversation, actually mm -hmm. how to, how to, that whole home funeral idea, which is yeah. the way things always used to be. Mm -hmm. And to have that, and, and then to dispose of the body in a way that a lot of people would not even think could be possible. Hmm. And, and so I didn't know until I went through the training. Hmm. So all these yeah. things are coming yes. out in the all media these now. Things. Yeah, we just and have, then, yeah. we have all these traditions and these thoughts about death and dying and what is supposed to happen. And that's one of the first things that when we're working with clients is what do you believe? You know, what do you believe about this loss? What were the traditions in your family and all that kind of stuff? And then are they serving you well? You know, are those the beliefs that you want to hang on to as you continue through this process and really evaluate that? Because we do like so many things just out of tradition or what our culture or whatever, without really contemplating if it's the best thing for us, if it's the best thing for our family, it's if it's what our loved one would have wanted. And yeah, so I'm hearing more about these like yeah, backyard services and things like that, bringing it back home and much more intimate and um, I just love that we're even exploring some of these things and seeing that there are alternatives to the way that it had been done in the past, you know, so I love all of that. I, I wanted to ask, so you're working with the person who's, you know, um, going to be passing away at what point when the person passes away is your relationship then with the family? Is that kind of the end or do you have some sort of transitional or after they pass away are you still in touch with them for a certain period of time talk to me a little bit about that mm -hmm. yeah for a period of time generally speaking it's it's not like um certain people um doulas do specialize in these areas like the grief work mm -hmm. and so that's that's not what we were specifically trained in mm -hmm. although I would offer that if that's what a person wanted, because having that trusting relationship already, mm -hmm. then to have that same person present through that initial grieving process anyway, mm -hmm. is so valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, I want to be sure to bring out that the, the more this planning and preparation and a person, this dying person having the opportunity to be in the driver's seat, and have those, those months, weeks, days unfold in the way that, that they wanted and mm -hmm. asked for, then, and the family's on board. <laughs> and some of these uncomfortable relationships can 
you know, there can be forgiveness and, mm. and resolution. And then there's, there's time to spend and saying goodbyes and telling stories and climbing into bed with their loved one. And it helps so much in the grief process. Yeah, a hundred percent. If you have that, I hate to call it a luxury because it definitely doesn't feel like a luxury, but having experienced just like you having to, having had experienced very sudden tragic loss compared to when my grandmother passed away and we had about six weeks and it was the sweetest I cherish those memories so much. Yeah, I had the best conversation with my life of my life with my grandma during that time and got to share, you know, the things in my heart and hear her stories and it, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And so um, making the most of that time for both sides, I think goes a long way with helping the grieving process, right? Because you get to get, uh, you get to say your goodbyes and do all of those things. So it's so, so powerful. So when you're working with somebody, let's say somebody gets a diagnosis and they have six months to live. Are you working with them for six months? Or let's say you take them through your process and you're actually done with, with all the planning and whatnot three months into it, or is it case by case basis, whatever the family's wanting? Oh, definitely. That is the case. Yeah. It's, that's really important because we offer, we make, we make suggestions and offer. And when it's really not in our, um, you know, in, in our realm of expertise, we make mm. referrals, mm. you know, or, but it's always in the way of an offering because mm. we're not advising, we're not right. consulting. We're there as a companion and a guide. And, and in the process, there's so much value that, that happens as far as, um, life reviews come coming back to what you said about with your grandma how mm -hmm. you were able to have that conversation and of course now we have cell phones we have so much technology for people to be able to record their voices yeah. to interview a member yeah. of their family and then and then the family has it afterwards yeah there's wrapping up presents for the next holiday there's writing letters there's photo books and even creating their own their own music lists of what this person wants to hear right. when they're in that active stage of dying um nearing death and and actively dying and uh, also i didn't mention comfort measures mm. because there's so much we can offer in that regard um, from from some things that maybe another person hasn't experienced before and now they're open to it like meditation mm. can be really helpful and that and um, some visualization um, prayer really allowing a person to talk about what they're afraid of you know yeah. as far as their death yeah what's it gonna be like and what they most fear about it and um, yeah, that's that's really important too in the whole process. Um, important, it's such important work. Like I'm so I'm so thankful that you exist and that there are people out there doing this work. If somebody if somebody who's watching this video um, finds themselves in this position, how specifically can they find you? How do you have a website? Where can uh, we send them? Yes, I have a website, and it's. My name, Holly, H-O-L-L-Y, and then E-O-L-D dot com. Holly, e -O -L -D. D dot com. End of life doula and, dot com. Perfect. I, I made it easy. <laughs> and then my email is one doula, Holly, at gmail dot com. Perfect. And, cool. and then I also have a group which I would love to invite any to any one of you to. It's it's a it is a private group by invitation, and you can go in and, and ask to join. Mm. And I'd love for you to join. It's called Brave Living with the End in View. Brave Living with the End in View. Yeah. And is that so, on Facebook? It is a Facebook group. Yes. Thank you okay. for asking me that. Yeah. Because well, will, eventually, yeah. Um, one other I will thing. give the links for all of these um, and we'll put them in the description so that people can 
easily access them and reach out to you or join the group or do whatever they need to do. But just honestly, thank you for, you know, I mean, it sounds like you've been doing this your whole life from nursing and everything else, just loving people well and caring for them when they're going through tough times. But especially with this end of life, thank you for, you know, being willing to be in the uncomfortable place and facilitate uncomfortable conversations and to be pioneering a new way that we would approach and care for those who are passing and those who love them. You know, it's just, there's so much room for improvement. And I'm just so thankful whenever I meet somebody doing such significant work. So thanks for opening, hopefully our viewers eyes to this whole new concept. And hopefully we can, you know, have families get some additional support in the future from it. Yeah. And, and, and realize that we're all going to die. It is a natural part of the life cycle. And as a result of taking a look at that and having conversations about death, it's yeah. actually a very healthy thing to do. And yeah. people who are willing to have those conversations are happier. Yeah. And, and they go about living their life in ways that maybe they wouldn't otherwise. Because it's like, oh, I'll take that vacation later. That used to be a big thing. You know, when I retire, yeah, I'll do this. And how about living our lives like we might put our head on the pillow for the last time tonight? How yeah. would we want our life to look? Yeah. I think our in my household, maybe we're a little jaded because of all the loss we've experienced because I actually, it's an ongoing conversation between my daughter and I about what I want to have happen at my funeral. And it's a bit absurd. Like I have all these ridiculous things that I've told her I want her to implement at the funeral. Like I want everybody to have an envelope under their chair and it'll have like random amounts of money. And so people will win things. We're gonna have <laughs> nonprofit organizations and the people who attend the funeral are gonna get to vote about where money goes to what nonprofit, you know? And we just have so many little inside jokes and funny sayings that I say, and I've told her, she needs to incorporate those in her eulogy, but she can't, she, she can't say, well, mom always used to say this. She just has to figure out a natural way to like weave all these crazy scenes <laughs> into it. Like <laughs> so we laugh about it and we joke about it. Um, and, and we talk about it all the time. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure normal families don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's a way to just like, you know, we've experienced it. We understand like, this is a part of life. If you make it to any kind of age, you're going to lose somebody in your family. You're going to experience death and loss. And so if we can demystify it and not make it so foreign and taboo, it's going to help us tremendously when it does happen that we don't feel like it's this alien experience, you know, that we've become familiar with it. Um, so, so even this conversation, you know, it's just helpful to talk about these things and expose these topics so people can be a little bit more comfortable with them but I love that I love yeah. your creative ideas and that's what it is all about it's like yeah if you could actually have it your own way how would how would you want to do it what if it could be actually fun right along with all the sadness and and everything that goes along with the grief and loss that people are experiencing to yeah. have, have it be that way. I had everybody up dancing at the, the celebration for my son's life. Yeah. I keep telling all my people who meet me, I'm like, you're going to want to outlive me because my funeral is going to be like the best party you've ever been to. Like, it's going to be a really good time. So you're, you should want to hope that I go before you because it's going to be a blast. So now it's not, now some of these things are recorded and on, you know, on, on tape. So now they really know that they have to stick to some of my requests and whatnot, but uh, okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up, but for folks that are watching, if you enjoyed this video, if you want other tips and tools for navigating grief and getting back to a life that you love, subscribe to our channel, hit the button below. And until next time, we'll see ya. I also do a, a complimentary consultation. Oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. Hit her up for a complimentary yeah. consultation. On the website, you'll find right. a spot where you can. All right.